Uh, Good evening, good evening. If you have a Bible, and I hope that you do, we please open it to Ephesians chapter 6. Make your way to Ephesians chapter 6. If you do not have a Bible, that's okay. There is one in front of you, and it's on page 979. So on the Bible in front of you, it's on page 979. Thank you so much for uh, being so hospitable, so loving, and so caring. It's been great uh, to be with you. But I will say, my wife sent me a text earlier today that uh, because they're an hour ahead of us that both my kids were saying that's daddy that's daddy on the tv so if I jet tomorrow it's because I want to go see my kids I might disappear I don't know Um, but uh, no it's really really good to be here I'm really grateful uh, to be with you and I hope that I can encourage you in some way uh, to stand in the strength of Christ and to put on the armor of God and stand firm against the schemes of the devil I do want to kind of just briefly review what we did uh, this morning and then we'll just kind of dive in uh, to Ephesians chapter 6 verses 14 through 16 And what we saw this morning was really simple, that the strength of Christ is the strength of the church, sufficient to stand against the schemes of the devil. And we saw the devil is kind of not lost and bewildered, but he's intentional and methodological. And he has, he, has, he has specific things he wants to do, temptation, persecution, false teaching, and division. But praise be to God who has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live, to die, to be buried, to be raised again. And now he is the ascended Lord of all, and every power on heaven and on earth are beneath his feet. That is the reality of the church. That's the reality of the Christian life. So let's look and read all of Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 again. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes, beginning in verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord. And in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can distinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me to open my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning, uh, this evening, and as we open up your word, We want to encounter the living God through the living word of God. We're not here to to hear from me that would not do much good. Father, we want to encounter the living God through his living word, to behold his glory, to be amazed at him and be changed. Exalt your name. Edify your church. Evangelize the sinner. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Paul instructs us in Ephesians 5.1 to be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love, he says, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Imitation is a wonderful, wonderful description of spiritual warfare. Why do I say that? Because the armor we're instructed to put on is the very character of God, the Holy Trinity. And in fact, the Trinity is seen all throughout Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Listen, we're to put on the strength of Christ by putting on the armor of God, praying at all times in the Spirit. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 is Trinitarian. In fact, Isaiah describes God as a warrior, dressed in armor, who will bring justice and righteousness. And wouldn't you know it, the armor that God wears in Isaiah matches the armor in Ephesians 6 almost identically. And it's very common 
for preachers to kind of play up. Paul was chained to that Roman centurion, and he could see that Roman armor, and that'll preach, but it's almost entirely wrong, okay? Uh, you can laugh. It's okay. Lighten up. Um, it's, it's almost entirely wrong because when we read the Old Testament, what do we see? God dressed in armor, Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness or truth the belt of his loins. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news or gospel, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. So the Old Testament is just flowing through Paul. He knows it so well that every time he writes, whether implicitly or explicitly, it just pours out of his pen. So it's no surprise that the images of armor that we're to put on is the very armor that God wears. We not only get it from him, it describes who he is. He is true, righteous, filled with peace. He's the source of our salvation. And he is the word. So tonight what we're going to do is to see that the church stands in the strength of Christ by taking up the whole armor of God. So this morning, the strength of Christ is the strength of the church sufficient to stand against the schemes of the devil. How do we stand? By taking up the whole armor of God. Now, I'm going to blow you away here, okay? This is A plus homiletics. Here's the sermon outline. Joe, you're not going to see this coming. Here it is. You ready? Fasten the belt of truth. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Put on readiness as the gospel of peace. And take up the shield of faith. Unbelievable. That is A plus sermon writing. Right there. Didn't see that coming, did you? The belt of truth. Put on the belt of truth. Verse 14. Fastening the belt of truth allows us to stand firm against the schemes of the devil because he is a liar. And Jesus pulls no punches when describing the devil in John 8, 44. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. But in Christ, our father is not a liar. The descriptions of God in the New Testament are not like this. Titus 1, 2, God never lies. The author of Hebrews said it is impossible for God to lie. So God is truth. He not only says true things, he not only decides what is true, he, he is true. That's who he is. And this God, who is faithful and true, has revealed himself in a number of ways. And the primary way he's revealed himself is through the gospel of Jesus Christ, which has a lot to do with truth. Let me prove it to you. So what truth are we to fasten on our belts? Look with me at Ephesians 1.13. It should be on the screen. The truth that we're to fasten to our belt is the gospel message and the life of truth that is lived by people who believe the gospel. Let me show it to you. Ephesians 1.13. In him you also heard the word of what? Truth. The gospel of your salvation. So, so what is the truth there? It's the gospel of your salvation. So we're, what we're supposed to put on, think through, is the truth of the gospel. And think with me how the truth of the gospel protects us from so many of Satan's lies. What, what might Satan lie about? Well, everything. Who God is. What's wrong with the world. How on earth we fix it. Where we're going. And the gospel protects us from all these things. I mean, in the gospel, we know the truth about God, who he is and what he is like. He is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In the gospel, we learn who God is and what he is like. But we also learn who we are and what we are like. And before we even get to sin, let's remember that God created us in his image. We are divine image bearers. That's who you are. Everyone in this room has been created in God's image. And sin has tainted it, but not removed it. 
In the gospel, we learn the truth about ourselves, the truth about how we're being renewed into that divine image as God conforms us into the image of Christ. In the gospel, we learn about what's wrong with the world, namely sin and its consequences, death. But I've got good news for you. In the gospel, we learn that God is making all things new through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in the gospel, we know what the future will be like. That Christ will come to judge the living and the dead. And when he does that, listen to me, he will come and wipe away every tear from our eyes. And death shall be no more. And neither shall be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. This is the true story of the world. And the church fastened it to her waist by placing the truth of the gospel at the very center of her worship, preaching, fellowship, and practice. And so when the saints gather, week in and week out, because the gospel's at the center of our worship, fellowship, preaching, and practice, it's like a weekly rhythm that tells you what is true amidst all these false stories that are in the world. And there are a lot of false stories in the world Monday through Saturday. Entertainment, news, advertisement, all types of these big stories that are teaching you about how the world is, where it's going, what's wrong with it, and how to fix it. And we swim in that all week. And the Lord has given us a rhythm, weekly rhythm, just like that. What is true? God is good, holy, and righteous. He created and sustained everything. Sin has broken everything, but praise be to God. God in his grace and his mercy has sent himself in the person and work of Jesus Christ to live, to die, to rise again. He is the ascended Lord of all, and everyone, every single person who looks to Christ and believes can be saved. That's the true story of the world. But we cannot miss the second part of fastening on the belt of truth. I said earlier, that fastening on the belt of truth was fastening on the gospel message and the life that's lived by all those who believe the gospel. What do I mean by that? Theologian David Wells says this, the church must remember two points in particular. First, Christianity is about truth. And the second, that those who say they are Christians must model this truth by their integrity. I can't think of anything more that will hurt our ability to reach this place than to profess that we believe in the truth of the gospel but fail to live it out in integrity. I can't think of a single thing. Excitement about Ephesians 1 through 3 that does not result in exemplifying Ephesians 4 through 6 will not only make us vulnerable to the schemes of the devil, it will do little for our mission. In Christ, the church is to speak the truth in love. That's how we walk out and live this truth. What does that mean? More than just speaking the truth in a nice way, it's to live for the good of the community in a way that's right, good, and just. We speak the truth in love. What else might Paul mean by fastening the belt of truth in our lives, by walking in integrity? Ephesians 5, 9. The church is to walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good, right, and true. True. And when the church believes the gospel and walks with integrity, with consistency, we give, according to Paul in Ephesians 4, no opportunity to the devil. And more than that, we're a visible display to the world of what is right, good, and true. We fasten the belt of truth. And then we put on the breastplate of righteousness. What does Paul mean by righteousness? Two things. The first thing he means is positional righteousness. What do I mean by that? The fancy theological term for this is forensic righteousness. This is the righteousness that we cannot get on our own. It has to be given to us by grace through faith. We, we can not achieve the righteousness that we need to be right before God. We can't, we can't do it. So this is the glory of justification. What do I mean by that? It means, that means one day, beloved, everyone will stand before God in judgment. Everyone. And there's only two verdicts. 
guilty or not guilty. And here's the beauty about justification. In justification, it's the glorious truth that in Christ, we get the not guilty verdict in advance. Righteous before God, that's justification. We get it through Christ and Christ alone. We cannot do it by ourselves. It's positional righteous, righteousness, and it's been announced through the presence through our faith in Jesus Christ. But there's another type as well, a moral or ethical type. We pursue a life of goodness, righteousness, and justice. So to put on the breastplate of righteousness would be to be virtuous. We can see this in Ephesians 4.24. Put on the new self, Paul says, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And I think Paul means both of these. You want to know why? Because we cannot manifest righteousness in our life without first receiving the righteousness of Christ through faith. And that's what all of us need, every single one. There's no amount of goodness, good deeds, service, nothing. We cannot be righteous before God on our own ever. But God does something amazing in the gospel. When you believe on Jesus Christ, he counts the righteousness of Christ toward you. And you're righteous before his sight. And those people who stand before God as righteous are to live with everything in their being to be right, good, and just out of the overflow of that goodness. Alexander McLaren says this really helpfully. He says, It is a counsel of despair to tell a man to put on that breastplate and to leave him in doubt where he is to find it or whether he has to hammer it together by his own efforts so he can put it on. There is no more unprofitable expenditure of breath than the cry to men, Be good, be good. Moral teaching without gospel preaching is little brother than a waste of breath. And that is exactly right. And as long as we understand that, it is right and good, pun intended, to exhort the church to walk not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. And so both of these views of righteousness are really helpful for pushing back against Satan and his schemes. For, for our positional righteousness before God that we get from Jesus Christ, it's so good to respond back to Satan when he comes to you and reminds you about past sin and guilt that absolutely drives you batty. And when he takes you to that place and he says, look at all this sin, look at this guilt, we tell him to look at Jesus Christ, who is our righteousness. For no one, absolutely no one, can accuse whom God has acquitted. And then righteousness and holiness also protects the church from Satan's schemes of temptation and sin. The pursuit of righteousness in all of life removes the devil's opportunity to exploit sin and harm the church. There's a third option about righteousness as well um, that we can talk about. I just want to mention it briefly. You may have noticed that society is hungry for righteousness. They're hungry for justice. And without the eyes to see through the gospel, we can find all bunch of misdirected backward ways to get there. But let me just be an encouragement to you. Let me be an encouragement to you, okay? No matter how poorly people define righteousness or justice, don't ever give up, not for a single moment of understanding that Christians in the righteousness of God are to be and pursue what is right, just, and good in all of society. Don't allow bad definitions to ruin you from doing what the Bible says that you're supposed to do. There's a lot more I could say about that, but at the risk of getting in trouble, let's move on. Now, we're going to talk more on Tuesday morning, uh, Tuesday evening about prayer. But I want to point to you a particular one of Paul's prayers that's so helpful when we think about the fruit of righteousness. I want you to listen to this prayer. So how do we put on the breastplate of righteousness? Listen to this prayer by Paul in Philippians 1, 19 and 11. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, 
fill with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, let me just ask you for a moment, if you can see that prayer on the screen, what, what do you think would happen if God's people gathered persistently and asked God to do this in their lives in church? What if we prayed prayers like this? God, give me knowledge and discernment to approve what is excellent, right, and good, so that it might be pure and blameless on the day of Christ, and just bear the fruit of righteousness that comes to Jesus Christ through faith. What if we prayed prayers like this? What, God, what might God do? What might God do as we pray prayers like this? So put on the breastplate of righteousness, of putting off sin, and prayerfully pursue the fruit of righteousness until Christ comes. So we stand in the strength of Christ, putting on the whole armor of God, the belt of truth and the, the breastplate of righteousness. But then we're to put on the readiness of the gospel of peace. And Paul doesn't say it like we would expect, does he? We would expect him to say, put on the shoes on your feet, wouldn't we? But that's not what he says, does he? Put on the readiness of the gospel of peace. What, how, what does that mean? How, how do I put on readiness? How do I put that on? We put it on to proclaim the gospel of peace. And no doubt, no doubt, Paul is alluding to Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those that bring good news or gospel and who proclaim peace. And used in this context, gospel proclamation is a means by which we stand firm against the devil. Now let's talk about peace for a moment. Because he says, put on as readiness on your feet the gospel of peace. Christ, as the center of the gospel, has brought peace between Jew and Gentile. And so in Ephesians 2, 13-14, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. And beloved, that's your story. Unless you're here this morning and uh, this evening and you're a Messianic Jew, this is your story. You've been brought near through the blood of Christ. And Christ came, Ephesians 2, 17, and he preached peace to you who are far off and preached peace to those who were near. The gospel is a message about peace. First, about peace with God. But do not miss this. Secondarily, peace between each other. Those who love division and proclaim to love the gospel are lying. Can't have it both ways. It's the gospel of peace. Gospel of peace. So how do we ready ourselves? What does that mean? How do we ready ourselves with this gospel of peace? I think it means two things. The first a readiness to rely on the gospel. We rely on the gospel by remembering it's the very power of God for salvation. It's the source of our unity and the very means of our growth. So we trust the gospel. We rely on it. We don't trust ourselves, our ideas, our means. We trust the gospel. Here's the second way. Readiness to preach the gospel of peace. Reliance on the gospel is primarily a defensive posture, but readiness to preach is offensive. If it is true that the God of this world has blinded the mind of unbelievers, then proclamation of the gospel is an act of spiritual warfare because it's through the gospel that God gives eyes to see, ears to hear, and he resurrects dead hearts. Man, that was my story. That this is my story. Growing up in and out of church my, my entire life, sit through sermons, I listened, I think, and left and dreamed about football and girls and other things, never gave it a thought, never had any guilt over sin, never thought twice about anything I ever did, did not care, thank you very much. But one day, assuming I'm good to go, because I live in America and go to a Baptist church, I'm, I'm, I'm solid, right? I'm, I'm good to go. One day, one day, I could hear the gospel as clear as I've ever heard it in my entire life. And I realized, wait a minute, wait a minute. This brother just said that it's good to be a Christian because you have peace and hope, and I have neither of those things. And at 17 years old, I was absolutely broken. 
And thanks be to God for older brothers who used to be in this church who grabbed me and taught me the gospel, told me that the blood of Jesus could cover all the, the, the baggage and the pain and, and all the junk that I felt. And so I left thinking, man, great, I've had a great, I've had a great revival. Uh, I, it's wonderful. I'm ready to go live my life. And as I began to be discipled and I read the Bible, I learned, man, something happened to me. You know what happened to me? God saved me. He gave me a new heart through the gospel. He changed my life forever. And if you remember, as a college freshman, one year into Bible college, I got baptized in, uh, not this church, the other one. This church, but a different building. You know what I'm saying? The, the other building over there, right? Right, yeah, get my ecclesiology right. Same church, different building, right? So same church, different building. And I profess faith in Jesus Christ through baptism. And maybe, that's, maybe, maybe, maybe your story is like mine. You know, maybe it's not, I hope, I hope Ray's story is not that way. I hope that she can't remember when God saved her because I'm just telling her the gospel her whole life and she's wanted to love Jesus her whole life. And so I'll baptize her when she's 10 or 12 or six or whatever. But maybe your story's like mine and God did something. And now it's time, isn't it? It's time to say, man, I want to follow Jesus. I want to profess him through baptism. And the people in this room will love you care for you, disciple you, and they're ready for you, if that is true of you. Bring on the gospel of peace. So when we proclaim the gospel, it's an act of spiritual warfare. Because when that preacher in, in uh, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, was proclaiming the gospel, God used it to bring me out of darkness and into light. Out of the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of his beloved son. Gospel proclamation is an act of spiritual warfare. And we understand very clearly that all of it's governed by God's sovereign grace. God willed uh, the blind to give sight, the proclamation of the gospel. But he does it through people preaching, does he not? So a passage very similar to the one we're looking at tonight. And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So don't grow weary, church. Do not grow weary about preaching the gospel. And let me tell you something. I'm not telling something that you don't know, but I grew up here for a long time, just like many of you. And I know that when broken, hurting people come into this place and sit in your Sunday school class and sit in pews to hear the preaching, what they need more than anything else is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ proclaimed for the forgiveness of sins. That's what they need. So don't grow weary. Don't grow weary. I don't know what's on your mind and your heart, what you're mad about that week. I don't, know, I don't know what it is. But when they come in this room, preach the gospel of peace. Don't need the gospel of peace that gives the light of the knowledge of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The gospel is a gospel of peace. Man, what it would look like. What it would look like if the church put on this piece of armor. Because I don't know if you've noticed, but peace is in short supply. So the church has an opportunity to be the place of refuge for a hurting world who can't find peace anywhere else. In the midst of Tucker Carlson tantrums and Rachel Maddow meltdowns, there has to be a refuge somewhere that preached the gospel of peace. Stand firm by putting on the whole armor of God. Fasten the belt of truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Ready your feet for the gospel of peace and take up the shield of faith. We're to take up the shield of faith for the purpose of extinguishing flaming darts of the evil one. So I told you earlier, Satan is a schemer. He has an intentional methodology to harm the church. He, he wants to harm your faith. And so he's got these fiery darts that he'll, he'll send your direction. And Paul tells us the shield of faith is the means to extinguish those darts. Again, just like this morning, that should be an encouragement to you. Just like James can say, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This should be an encouragement. Take up the shield of faith, and you can extinguish the fiery darts of the devil. Simply put, faith, we might say, is a trust that is satisfied in all who God is. In all that God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Faith 
is a trust that is satisfied in all of who God is and all what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. So Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. It's a total trust in all of who God is and what he has done for us in Jesus Christ. But I want to read to you Ephesians 3.16-19. through 19. Remember this morning when I read Ephesians 1.19-23, I told you, I want you to cling to every word like it's just giving you life. That's another one of those times. But pay very close attention to the words I'm about to read because they are really, really good. And it's very, very important to understand what Paul means by the shield of faith. So, so faith plays a role in Paul's prayer in Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. So let's, let's read that. Paul prays, starting in verse 16, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Do you catch that? How does Christ dwell in your heart? Through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So in other words... Through faith, we access the very power of God, which strengthens our inner being with the presence of Jesus. And through faith, we can comprehend Christ's love for us, which is so immeasurable. We have to pray for spiritual strength to understand it. So so how much, beloved, does Christ love you? You have to pray for strength to grasp it. That's how much. And this piece of armor is absolutely vital for standing against the schemes of the devil. Why, why is that? You know, earlier I said that Jesus is the resurrected and ascended Lord and that every power is beneath his feet. Name, you know, every power in heaven and on earth are all beneath his feet. But let's be honest just for a second. Life does not look that way all the time, does it? When you turn on the news or you live your difficult life of living in a sinful world, life does not look like every evil power is beneath Christ's feet. It doesn't look that way. And I've got a biblical uh, precedence for this. Hebrews tells us, Now in saying, all things were subjected to him. Presently, we do not see everything in subject to him. Hebrews 2, 8 and 9. And that means the church is going to struggle and suffer and feel hurt and pain, and it will be very, very difficult in this sinful and fallen world as we wait the consummation of Christ's kingdom here on earth. It will be difficult. And Satan loves to come talk in our ear in the midst of difficult, in the midst of pain, in the midst of suffering. And this is what he'll do. Look at all this suffering. Look at all this pain. Look at all this hurt. Look at all these tears. God has left you. And strengthened by the Spirit, taking up the shield of faith, we say, no, Christ dwells in our heart through faith. He is so present with us, devil. He has made our hearts his very home. That's where he is. So if that doesn't work, he'll come back and say to you this, look at the gravity of all your sin. You are unrighteous, unholy. Look at the gravity and weight of all of your sin. Christ cannot love you. Not you. No, Christ cannot love you. And through faith, the shield of faith, what does the church say? If given all of eternity, devil, it would still not be enough time to measure the height, width, length, and breadth of Christ's love for us. It wouldn't be enough. It wouldn't be enough time. What measurement you go, you go, Satan, and find a tool of measurement that can measure this love. Best of luck. 
Beloved, listen to me. There's some of you in this room because life is hard. You are, you are struggling. You are suffering. And it might be possible that you're doubting Christ's very love for you. I'm here to tell you Christ loves you so much you have to pray to grasp it. He loves you so much you can't even understand. It surpasses knowledge. Christ is near to you and he loves you. He loves you. That is what is true of you. And so we take up this shield of faith, don't we? By praying and asking God for the strength to comprehend the height, depth, width, and Christ's love for us. So he can dwell in our hearts through faith. And that is the way when he starts sending those fiery darts towards us, they're extinguished. They're extinguished. The church stands in the strength of Christ by putting on the whole armor of God, partly by fastening the belt of truth of the gospel, putting on the breastplate of righteousness, ridding our feet with the gospel of preach, proclaiming it far and wide so the spirit can work to bring people out of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son. And then we take up the shield of faith. So that when everything we can see with our eyes tells us that the world has gone to absolute hell. That God is coming to judge the living and the dead. And he will, he will wipe away every tear from your eye. And death will be no more. And pain will be no more. He will be with us and he will be our God. So stand, church. Stand in the strength of Christ, which is sufficient to stand against the schemes of the devil. And take up the whole armor of God for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus and we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for its clarity and sufficiency. We're so grateful for your character, which is the very armor of God that we're to to put on. And so I pray, God, that we would put on uh, the, the belt of truth. We would put on the breastplate of righteousness. We would ready our feet with the gospel of peace. And we would take up that shield of faith for your glory and your honor, I pray. Amen.